Good morning, church, and hear this morning's call to worship. For the beauty of the summer day and the comfort of friends nearby, for the invitation to love and to be loved, for the God who extends that call, for time set apart to nourish the soul, and for time to go out into the world armed with love, for all these things we give thanks. Let us worship God. Of all 
please come the pastures we call grace a mighty river flowing upwards from a deep but empty grave i will praise you on the mountain i will chases out the world's darkness. You calm our storms and replace hate with love. We are so thankful for your faithfulness and patience with us. These days, our worries and our concerns can be overwhelming. Forgive us for allowing them to take over our hearts and minds. We need your help to turn away from our circumstances and to refocus our thoughts on you. Please calm our worries and allow us to feel your presence surround us. Strengthen us with the courage to face our challenges with your spirit by our side. We place our trust in only you, Father. Amen. Well, good morning again, church. It's good to be together as we're here and as we're there, wherever you may be this morning. As we come to the joys and concerns in the morning prayer, I want to share with you a little bit of news from the Board of Deacons. The deacons met this prior Sunday evening, and I know a lot of people have been talking about when are we going to open up, when are we going to be able to gather together as the people of God in this physical space. We had a very good meeting in which I think the deacons gave voice to much of what you are thinking out there, uh, the concerns about coming together too soon, uh, the worries about what will happen when we do come together, the desire for that communion, and at the end of it all, uh, when all was said and done, the deacons decided to recommend that uh, the church council and uh, the leadership not open the church until the beginning of August, the end of July, so the beginning of August at the earliest. The deacons are going to meet again on July the 12th, and at that meeting, they're going to consider the landscape as it is. As most of you know, we don't have much feedback in terms of data, in terms of what happens when the church opens up or when the culture opens up. And it's our hope and desire that a month from now, we'll have some input. We'll know some experiences that churches have had, and we'll be able to make a more informed decision at that time. The bottom line is every single one of us want to be here on Sunday morning, and uh, soon we'll be able to do that. But we wanted to update you. I also want you to keep the leadership in prayer as they make these decisions. And very soon you'll be hearing from one of your deacons. 
Uh, your deacon, whoever is assigned to you as the shepherd, will be either emailing or calling you so that you can give some input on those questions. Just a couple of questions, mostly uh, trying to figure your heart and mind in terms of what you'd like to see in terms of when we reopen and how we reopen. So look for that uh, this week from your deacon. Now in terms of joys and concerns, we obviously want to continue to pray for those folk who have uh, concerns about COVID, uh, the virus, the coronavirus, and those who are suffering from it. And we also want to keep in mind those who have suffered because of the coronavirus, so those who are unemployed and those who uh, are looking for work now. And uh, also we want to consider the state of the union in our country as protests continue about the death of George Floyd and how we can, as the people of God, uh, talk about uh, equality in a way that considers us all as children of God. You have joys and concerns, I'm sure, also. So let's take a moment of silence wherever we are and bow our heads in prayer, and then I'll lead us together in prayer. Creator God, the scripture we read this morning tells us that you literally <laughs> breathed all that is into being. And you can be dis discerned, you can be seen in, in all that is, all that we see, all that we touch, in the harmony of nature, and in, in watching a hummingbird flutter its wings by our face, the grandeur of a mountain range. Thank you for this world. Thank you, in spite of the heat, for this summer weather that reminds us that there's no shadow of turning with you. Summer and winter and springtime and harvest, sun, moon, and stars in their heavens above, join with all nature and manifold witness to thy great faithfulness, mercy, and love. Thank you for the summer sun that reminds us that your creative breath didn't just create way back then, but you're in the business of creating and recreating even today. And so we pray for all of those places in our world, here in the United States, around the globe, where people are suffering because of the coronavirus, because of the effects of the coronavirus, because of injustice and unrighteousness. In a moment, Lord, we'll lift up our voice and pray that prayer that's so well known to us. But in the prayer, we want to recommit ourselves to the, the strength of the words we pray. Give us this day our daily bread so that we may give it to others. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And use us as your kingdom workers, we pray. Thank you for the warmth of your love and for sustaining us and this world. This beautiful garden, the Garden of Eden in perfection at the beginning of the world and the garden we live in inhabited by you right now. We pray this all in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
And now I ask the kids to gather around the TV or to gather around the computer or maybe even gather around the throne for the children's story. And I got a very special children's story this morning, but I have to sit down because it is so hot. And it's been so hot this week. I asked somebody to turn the air conditioning on in the church, but nobody's done it yet. So here we are. And you know, it's been so hot that when I went to bed at night this week, I slept in my bathing suit. And the reason I did that was I thought maybe that would help me dream that I was swimming. Because it was so hot, even in my house with the air conditioning on. And I was just getting ready to complain about how hot it was. Oh, and by the way, I wanted to tell you, I have my bathing suit now on under my pants. Because afterwards, I'm going to go to Cole Bushmeyer's house and try out his new pool. You're all welcome to come if anybody would like to come after church. I was just about ready to complain about how hot it was when I remembered that. And maybe it's like you too. I think this is my favorite season of the year. And I'll tell you why. Because when I go outside of the house in the winter, first thing in the morning, you know what I hear? That's, that's what I hear. I don't hear anything. I don't see the little chipmunk who lives under my sidewalk. I, I don't hear any of the birds because they're not there. I, I, I don't see the sun because we live in Pittsburgh. I mean, and now when I go outside in the morning, like I did this morning, I went outside and I heard birds. And if you ever stop to just listen to the birds, there's just birds of different types and sounds and they're all talking to each other in words we can't understand and I saw a hummingbird and I looked and the chipmunk was running across the sidewalk so we have windows on the side of our door where we have two cats one cat sits in this window some cat sits in this window and they just watch that chipmunk and I think they'd like to play with him or something else I'm not sure but they just sit there and watch him for hours and then there's a rabbit that comes out while I'm doing dishes at night, right down on the grass. And he joins the chipmunks and the birds and, and all the other creatures that are in the world. And I think, you know, this is what's best about summer. It just reminds you about how wonderful God's world is. Because we're not inside all of the time. We're outside. We're playing. I can hear you kids, the sound of you kids, until it's dark and even beyond. And I think... It's a wonderful world that God created. And it never feels more wonderful in, than in summer when we can see the beauty and glory of all creation. So if you're going swimming this afternoon, have a great time. Splash around for me for a while. Play Marco Polo. Whatever it is you want to do, just take a moment too to give thanks to God for how beautiful, how wonderful this world is. Let's pray together. Gracious God, thank you we are not wanting to complain because we know how you have gifted us in so many special ways. And so thank you for the freedom and the joy that summer brings. And may we experience it and bring it to others in all we do today and this week in Jesus' name. Amen. We want to think for a moment about how we give our tithes and offerings at this particular point in the service. And as we remind you every week, we hope you'll continue to support the ministries of the church and the mission of the church, too. I might remind you that this month is one great hour of sharing month also. And the mission board is promoting that offering that goes to help people around the globe in situations that are unexpected and unanticipated. You can give online at nhcbc.com. Or you can just send your check or your money to NHCBC at 7801 Thompson Run Road, Pittsburgh, 15237. But as you think about what you're going to give, I want to tell you a brief story. Thomas Carlyle, an author, a philosopher of some 150 years ago, he talked in one of his stories about having been a little boy of about eight years old when his parents were out back in the farm and left him alone there at the house. And someone knocked on the door. Now, this would have been probably about 1850. He went to the door. He lived in England. He opened the door, and there was a hobo. And the hobo asked him for 
some money or something that could help him. And Thomas Carlyle, eight years old, went into his bedroom, got his piggy bank, smashed it, broke it open, and gave the, little, the hobo all the money that was in his bank. And it's not so much the act of Thomas Carlyle, but it's what he said about that act. Carlyle said, to this point in my life, that was my most joyous moment when I could crack that piggy bank open and just give all that I had to that man. When Carlyle says that, he reminds me of Jesus' words in Acts chapter 20, verse 35. Jesus says, it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. And may you and I have that experience this week. One Great Hour of Sharing works with life-changing ministries like the New Life Center in Thailand, an organization that serves Hill Tribe minority girls and young women who are at high risk for or survivors of sexual abuse, domestic violence, and human trafficking. Investing time and resources and sharing the love of Christ to help these girls see a different future. We have to hate them one day. My a future filled with opportunities for friendships, for education, for healing. Thank you for investing in my future. Thank you. Thank you for investing in my future. Scripture reading this morning comes from the first chapter of Genesis, verses 1, 2, and 3. And the Word of God says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. I invite you to pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts together be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. It was uh, somewhere about two years ago that a pastor friend of mine recommended a book to me. Now, most of the people who know me know I like to read, and I'm always open to suggestions, especially if it comes from a friend or a pastoral colleague, so I asked him the name of the book and the name of the author, wrote it down, and when I went home that afternoon, I logged on to Amazon.com, and they were glad to see me again. I hadn't visited for a day, and I put in the name of the book and the author, and I ordered the book. And two days later, it was two days later because it was before the coronavirus, uh, a book appeared on my doorstep. Now, I have a routine whenever a book appears on my doorstep. The first thing I do is I bring it inside, and if it's in a box, I'll use the scissors to kind of cut that tape and open it up. And if I can just tear the, you know, the paper, I do that. And then I extract the book. And the very first thing I do, without exception, is this. <sighs> I do. I smell books. And a lot of people in the congregation have said to me over the years, Pastor, you need a Kindle. You should really get a Kindle because you can put hundreds of books on that Kindle. You can even highlight on that Kindle. You can carry those books with you to Nicaragua. And here's what I say every time somebody tells me to get a Kindle. First of all, I have a Kindle. I have one on my phone. And I have one on my computer. But I rarely use it. And here's the reason why. Kindle doesn't smell. 
Or at least Kindle doesn't smell like book glue, which is the smell of heaven, I think, in the days to come. So that's the first thing I do. I, I smell the book. Then the next thing I do, every book I get, is I kind of crack open the spine a little bit, and then I turn to chapter one, and I read the whole first chapter, whatever book it is, fiction, nonfiction, because it's kind of an anticipation, a, a tease, you know, here's what's to come. So on that day, two years ago, when the book arrived, I opened to chapter one, and I started to read. And here's some of what I read. Most churches in Western society are dying. Half the churches in North America average 75 people or less at worship in a typical Sunday morning. 76% of baby boomers self-identify as Christians. Now when it comes to Gen X, those are the people born between 1965 and 1980, 67% of them self-identify as Christians. And when it comes to the millennials, those people who are typically born between 1981 and 1986, 49% of them self-identify as Christians. So what that means is with each succeeding generation, the percentage of that generation which identify as Christians is going down. In the last 15 years, the number of people who have identified themselves, religious affiliation, none. The number of people who identified as none has doubled in the last 15 years. And every year in North America, some 3,700 churches close. That's what I read in chapter one. So I'm at the kitchen table and I put the book down, and the first thing I'm thinking is, I wonder what Amazon's uh, policy on return books is. Because a person can only stand so much bad news, and a pastor can only stand so much bad news. And, I, and I'm really kind of allergic to bad news. So if somebody comes to me and says, I got some good news and I got some bad news, what do you want first? I will always say, give me the good news first, then leave. I don't need to hear any of the bad news. So I put that book away probably for a week or two. And then I said to myself, well, I looked at the table of contents. There are 16 chapters in there, so I should probably, probably go back and read the next 15, which I did. And I'm glad I did, because this book is now well marked. It's called Canoeing the Mountains, Christian Leadership in Uncharted Territory. And it's written by a Presbyterian minister by the name of Todd Bolsinger. And Bolsinger says... This is the state of the church in Western society in North America, but he compares it with an experience that was had by Lewis and Clark. Now, I don't know how, how interested you are in history, but I think most everybody's heard of Lewis and Clark. And Lewis and Clark were the ones who set out on that journey westward to try to find a connection from the Mississippi River to the Pacific Ocean. And on June 20th, 1803, President Thomas Jefferson called them into the White House and commissioned them and a small group of people to go out west. He said he wanted them to find the quickest and uh, most navigable commerce uh, by river to the Pacific Ocean. A lot of people were hunting for this. Actually, for the last 300 years before that, there were four sovereign nations that were looking for a waterway to the Mississippi to the Pacific Ocean because they knew it would just open up that continent for commerce and growth. So when, when Lewis and Clark left the White House that day, June 20th, 1803, I'm fairly certain that they had in their mind this idea that they were going to become known as the people who discovered the Northwest Passage. Because what they had in their minds was this, that at some point when they got out west there, they'd come to a gently descending slope, a kind of a mountain that would be about a half day's journey down and there would be a river below. And so they'd be carrying all their supplies and the canoes on their back. And when they got down to that river, it would be the Columbia River and they'd put the canoes in there and all their supplies and the current would swiftly carry them to the Pacific Ocean. But instead, when they got to this particular point out west, they didn't find a river, they found 
the Rocky Mountains, <laughs> which is most decidedly not a river. I've seen the Rocky Mountains. I know some of you have too. They're imposing. They're indomitable. Can you imagine the reaction? These people with canoes and oars and maybe life preservers, and there's these mountains. One of the members of Lewis and Clark's uh, group actually kept a journal, and on September 16th, 1805, he wrote these words in the journal, and I quote, we proceeded over the most terrible mountains I ever beheld. It continued snowing until 3 o'clock p.m. when we halted, took more soup, and then went on. It was snowing. Did I mention it was September 16th, 1805? <laughs> so the rest of Bolsinger's book goes on to ask the question, what happens in life or in churches when we are expecting a river and instead we find mountains? That's a good question. And it is a good question for the Western church in particular because for generations we've been working on a set of assumptions that have served us well. The church has grown, it has prospered. But now we've come to a place in history where according to all external variables, those same assumptions might not work. So what do you do when you're expecting the river and you've been expecting it and traveling it all along and instead there are mountains? And the answer simply for Lewis and Clark and for us is, well, you either admit defeat or you change your suppositions and you change your line of attack. And that's what Lewis and Clark did. And Bolsinger is asking, now what's the church going to do? What's the church going to do? Is it time for the church to sell its canoes and buy some horses? What's the church being asked to do? That's the question I'm going to ask, not just this morning, but for the rest of the summer Sundays this year. I'm going to work a little bit off Bolsinger's book, but mostly off of the scriptures to ask that question. Where are we as a church, and where does God want us to be? What do we need to carry along with us in our DNA? What do we appreciate about the church? What do we feel God is asking us to do as a church? All of these questions. And it's not going to be just a one-sided conversation. Because every week, I'm going to ask you to respond. At the end of the sermon, or soon thereafter as you can, because you'll forget about it if you go home and go swimming in the Bushmire pool. So you want to go home and send me an email what are the dreams for the church? Where should we be going? What's God calling us to do? And so this morning, I thought, what better place to start than at the beginning? And so we went all the way back to the beginning, Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. And you know, this is a very well-known scripture, so it's not always the kind of scripture that gives you goosebumps, but I have to say that this week when I was reading that scripture, it literally gave me goosebumps. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was without form and void. And there was darkness over the waters. And the spirit brooded over the chaos. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. So when you first open the scriptures, the first thing we learn is who God is and what God does. Who is God? God is the one who creates, who takes literally nothing and makes something out of it. And for six days, God is just going around creating, creating, creating. And at the end of the sixth day, he looked at everything and he said, it's very good. And we too look around and say, it's very good. God is the one who creates, he sustains, he orders, he preserves, he provides, he loves. It's this God who put it all together way back when, took a rest, and now it's all just humming along. God is the creator. And I want to assert this morning that God is the recreator too. But there are a lot of people that notice something about that biblical passage, and that's it's in the past tense. Not surprisingly, because we say, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He created it way back then. But there are a lot of people, especially down through the ages, who have this feeling that once God, 
God was done creating. He went to Starbucks and then got a, a cappuccino and just watched it all play out. And if you know anything about history or religious history, you know there was such a thing as deism about 200 years ago. It's interesting, it's just about the same time as Lewis and Clark's journey. But in 1802, an English clergyman by the name of William Paley wrote a book, and it was called Natural Theology. And Paley, in his book, said that God was the one who set it all in motion. And remember, this is a time of the rationalism and enlightenment. A lot of people were beginning to question the existence of God. And so the deists were people who wanted to say, no, it just makes sense that there's a God. So Paley in his book tells this story about what you might say the watchmaker. He says, let's say you're walking through a, a huge field, overgrown, and you're just feeling your way through, and you come across a watch on the ground, a pocket watch. And you pick that watch up, and you look at it. He said, and you might assume with reason that somebody created that watch that somebody lost it there in the middle of the field, but most assuredly you wouldn't think that the watch created itself. It just put the grass together, a little bit of ground, some metal over here. It is obvious to us as human beings, if we find that watch, that there must be a watchmaker, and therefore there must be a God, a creator, who set this all in motion. Now that had a double-edged purpose. The good part of that was it seemed like a pretty compelling argument for the existence of God. The bad part of that was that we end up with this image that God just winds up the watch and lets it go on its own. And it's a pretty static view of God. And it's definitely not the view of the scriptures. I mean, we're going to really get to a scary passage in two weeks, Isaiah chapter 43, verse 19, where God says, to the people of Israel. Look, I'm doing something new. There it is. Do you see it? And I say that's a scary passage because that means, wait a minute, we got to change. And as I've told you on numerous occasions, nobody likes change except the wet baby. Look, I'm doing a new thing. Then in the next to the last chapter of the Bible, in Revelation 21, the apostle John says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. And God said, and God was saying, I'm making everything new. And the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he says, when a person becomes a Christian, they become automatically a brand new creation. So our picture of God given to us through the Word of God in the Scripture is that God has rolled up his sleeves seven days a week. 86,400 seconds a day, and he's immersed in that creation and recreation. And that ought to be our image, that God is active, alive, with us, in us, through us. Now, I'll mention one more book. If you've not read this, it's worth reading, especially if you like reading Christian books. This one is small. It's by G.K. Chesterton. It's about 110 pages, and it's 110 years old, but it reads like it was written yesterday. It's called Orthodoxy. In that book, Chesterton describes how God created, and I've got to quote this image for you. He says this about God's creation. Is it possible that God says every morning to the sun, do it again? And every evening to the moon, do it again. It may not be automatic necessity that makes all daisies alike. It may be that God makes every daisy separately because God never gets tired of making them. It may be that God has the eternal appetite of infancy and our God is younger than we are. I love that picture. And I just get this picture of God. How many daisies are there in the world? I don't know, billions, trillions. And you just see God saying, okay, there's a daisy. Now, okay, daisies you just duplicate, replicate. But instead God says, well, that's one. Do it again. And boom, there's another daisy. And God's busy all day long just making daisies. And not just making daisies, but involved in and through us too. That's the picture the scriptures present, a God who's active, alive, and involved. 
God's creating even today. And it may be that God is recreating something new. Just when Abraham was all set, he was receiving social security, had his pension. Sarah and he were very comfortable in the front porch swing. It's at that moment in Genesis 12 that God says, pack your luggage. Abraham says, where are we going? God says, oh, I'll let you know every night. Can't put that into the GPS. What's God asking us to do? In the church, at least, as the Bolsinger describes it in the North American church, something is not working with the suppositions we're using. So what is God asking us to do to create or to recreate? Because the world is so different now. I, I read uh, in one of the magazines I get, uh, it's called, I think it's called Fast Company, uh, and, and it's not a bad magazine. Uh, <laughs> it's a movie about uh, developing companies. And Tom Goodwin, who's senior vice president of strategy and innovation at Havas Media, he wrote in an essay these words, Uber, the world's largest taxi company, owns no vehicles. Facebook, the world's most popular media owner, creates no content. Alibaba, the most valuable retailer in the world, has no inventory. And Airbnb, the world's largest accommodation provider, owns no real estate. And he ended that essay by saying, something interesting is happening. And it's not just happening in the world. I'm doing a new thing. Do, do you see it? <laughs> One more example. In 1969... Switzerland was the world's largest producer of watches. 65% of all the watches in the world were created, manufactured in Switzerland. And 80% of the profits sold, selling watches returned to Switzerland. Now just 10 years later, in 1979, only 10% of the watches in the world were made in Switzerland, and 50,000 of the 65,000 people that were manufacturing watches in Switzerland had lost their jobs. So what happened in 10 years? Well, here's what happened. In 1967, the researchers in those Swiss watch companies came to their parent companies and said, we have an idea for a great invention. It was called the quartz model. And it was a quartz watch. And they presented it. They made a presentation to all of the Swiss watchmakers. And the Swiss watchmakers looked at this, and they dismissed it out of hand. And that won't work. That's not a watch. They looked at it. They said, there's no, uh, there's no mainspring. There's no gears. There's uh, none of the normal things that are in a watch. The, the, um, the inventor said, but we can prove to you that this watch is 1,000% more accurate than the old mechanical model. No, nah, never work. Well, what happened is a couple of months after they made that presentation, those same researchers took that model to a trade show. And one day at the trade show, some representatives for Seiko and Texas Instruments walked by and saw that, and the rest is history. They were fine. They were making watches. But their assumptions, just in a 10-year span, they changed. Our God is creating and recreating. So as your pastor, who uh, has been here 30 years, creating, recreating, I'm asking you the question, what is it about our church that you love? What is it about our church that you'd not ever like to lose? What is it that you think God might be calling us to do with those things that we love about the church? Where have we come to a mountain instead of a river? And what is God telling us to do? And what does it mean to sell uh, the canoes and buy horses? I, I know that's a lot of amorphous questions but I know a lot of you can handle those in different ways. So what I'm asking you to do again is when the service is over, just stay there if you're on your computer and email me. It's a hard email to remember, timothy.e.spring at gmail.com. 
What's God asking us to do? If we begin with the premise and the assumption that the Lord God isn't just creating and letting the world go, but he's rolled up his sleeves and is actively involved in who we are and what we're doing. I don't want this to be a one-way conversation, and I promise you that when you respond to me, you may hear your words parroted back at you in a future sermon. And if you don't want quoted, just let me know. But I have great confidence that God is going to work in and through us as a body to show us where we've been, where we are, and where God wants us to go. Let's pray together. Almighty God, I thank you for this particular body of believers, for the people gathered here in the sanctuary, and for all those who are watching online. You literally have given us what we need, community, fellowship, a mission, and your presence. So we pray that in the midst of that mix, you will create us, you will recreate us for your mission in this world at this time. In Christ's name, amen. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all and remain with us always. Amen.